quickly attach them. And I think we are live. Welcome, everybody. I am here with Paul from Understanding Conspiracy and Shelly from There's No Place Like Home. And I have no idea what we're going to discuss today, but we're going to have fun while we do it. So welcome. And if you're on here, uh, please leave a comment and let us know that you're here so we can say hey to you. I'd like this to be interactive as much as possible. So if you've got a question, uh, you know, like put it in all caps or something so I can see it. If we get really, really busy, then uh, it can be, hi, Tracy. It, it it might get, I might have trouble keeping up, but I'll, I'll try. All of my children are gone, so I have nobody to mo moderate. So if there's a creepo in the comment or something in the comments, let me know. And we'll, we'll try to keep this under some kind of control, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome, have guys. With that. <laughs> yeah, have fun with that. I think everybody knows you guys, but uh, please do introduce yourselves. Oh, shall I go first? Yeah. Go. Sure. Okay. Um, I'm Paul, and I run the YouTube channel Understanding Conspiracy. Um, I am primarily known as the guy who talks about the Nephilim looking like clowns, but I, uh, I dip my toes in a bit of everything here and there to do with conspiracy. So that's that's pretty much me in a nutshell. And I'm Shelly. Sorry if you see me jostling this around. I'm just trying to hear better. I'm Shelly. Um, I have the YouTube channel, There's No Place Like Home. And my most popular series is the Question the Narrative series, in which that is exactly what I do. I question the narrative, all things. And I'm really looking forward to our chat tonight. Okay. And I am Donita, the uh, tin hat wearing fifth generation Oklahoma panhandle pioneer. And no, I'm not going to wear it the whole time, but hey, you know that I've got this snazzy, fancy tin hat, and it's just important. It really... Some people just don't like my tin hat, and it's like, <laughs> um, anyway, I'm ready to irritate some people. You guys have had some uh, interesting comment section stuff going on in your comments here lately i'm not big enough for people to get that uh thank you tracy uh i'm i'm not big enough to to have those kinds of comments yet so i'll i'll let you guys kind of explain what some of your comments are and <laughs> Well, I have recently been looking into something called preterism, and it just intrigues me because I, the first time that I heard about it was with the whole short season aspect. I actually heard about preterism for the first time on Exploring Tartaria, and so recently it's been picking up traction, and I thought, okay, I'm going to look into it into this but then right the, the night before i was going to record a video about it some other channels had done very uh critical uh videos about it and that really got people riled up by the time that i posted my video because my i was coming from the complete opposite end i was like hey you know you have to look at this objectively you know don't go into it right away with the idea that it's wrong so i was getting comments saying that like i was of the devil or i was being led by satan and they were saying that preterism is of the devil or what is it the doctrine of demons <laughs> so you know i've been called and and other videos too you know i've been called a shill i was just called a shill again last night and i'm like my 11 children would find that hilarious um and shilly, just, shilly. i saw that one shilly shilly it, yeah and it's crazy because one thing that i said is first of all these are all supposedly believers commenting like this and then second of all, I always say, you know, those who trust the mainstream narrative, they're pretty good about staying together when they are supporting a common view. And unfortunately, those of us who do question the narrative, some people who are even supposedly on our side really just come at you and are just cutthroat. And it becomes very hard to distinguish between people who genuinely are commenting and then those who are just trolls. It's just hard to tell. 
Yeah. I, I'm, I'm, my, my, I have the same issue, Shelley. You are not alone. <laughs> okay. This is a, I mean, when I, I, I only started talking about this topic quite late to the game, to be honest. I, I, I made a video, maybe, I think I've got it up here on my phone. It was, um, I forgot the year and the, the month this was. 29th of September is when I made my first video on this. Um, and since then, it's just been, I've just rolled with it because it's just one connection after another. It's one of those topics which is just so all encompassing. And as somebody who's been researching conspiracy theories for like over a decade, it just keeps making more and more sense the more I apply this lens over everything else that we've been researching for years, you know? So I couldn't, I just couldn't leave it alone because, um, you know, I've been thinking about this for a few years. Exploring Tartaria was, again, the main channel I first saw, which made me think, what is this? <laughs> like, what, yeah. what is she saying? Like, this is insane, you know, but there's so much there. And uh, I just sat on it for like three years, just, just stewing in my brain, trying to figure it all out, you know. And when I did speak up a year ago, yeah, it's just been one, one accusation of, of heresy after another. Um, it's really shown me a lot about the Christian culture that I just did not know existed. I didn't understand how divided it truly was. I thought, you know, one love fits all for Christianity was pretty much it. I was quite naive, I suppose, because I wasn't raised in a church and I you know I suppose I've never really been in that world. But uh, now I, I've become far more knowledgeable on the factions of Christianity that truly do exist. That just w was not aware of. I, I get, I had an a millennial today actually messaged me funnily enough and it's just the, these outright factual comments they give you as this like they they know exactly how everything is type of attitude they're like uh you know the thousand year reign of christ hasn't happened it's happening it isn't a literal reign of christ on earth jesus is reigning now in heaven one thousand signifies a large number when jesus returns then comes the end for the earth as it is now we will have a new heaven and earth what matters now is whether a person repents and believes the gospel and that's it, just full stop done. So I commented back, so you're an amillennialist then. That's what you've just given me, the perfect amillennialist summary of that worldview. And I don't know how to respond to these people. It's like, well, what about Revelation 7? You have missed out the short season there. You've just ignored, you've breezed over that section of the book where it says after the millennial reign, there is a short season where Satan deceives all the nations. What you've just told me is that the millennial kingdom isn't physical. It's just kind of this indeterminate amount of time because a thousand years doesn't exist as a thousand years and then suddenly new jerusalem and heaven and earth will just happen and that's it that's just what you believe because that's not what the book says <laughs> and i keep giving these kind of responses to people and it's just more and more like no you're just you're just a shill clearly you're just a shill out there to <laughs> deceive deceive them this is the great deception what you're doing is propagating the great deception and all i can think is this is the great deception 20 people on youtube theorizing and just thinking out loud about a concept this is it <laughs> like, and it's like if there's anything's going to be a great deception it's probably what the majority of christians believe and it is this bizarre futurist doctrine where and uh, one week is somehow 2,000 years, you know, <laughs> I, I, I can't square it in my mind how they can make sense of that. But for many years, I was on board with their worldview. And now I've just questioned the narrative a little bit. Yeah, on it. the backlash has been wild, absolutely wild. Yeah, and what, what really gets me is, like you were saying, with how definitively they are so 100% sure that they are right. And I'm just like, you know what? I'm, I don't think that when it comes to eschatology, I'm not ever going to get there because there is always the possibility that you're wrong because eschatology is enigmatic. And I was saying the other day to Donita, I think that, you know, it really helps people to actually get into God's word with how enigmatic it is. And with me, I have been reading the word more than I ever have because I have been so into eschatology lately. And so for me to say, okay, that's it. I have it all figured out when millions and millions of people who have studied far longer than I have still don't agree. You know, I, I just think that we need to be careful to not say, okay, we have it all figured out and then not leave room for the possibility, even if it's a slight possibility, you know, that we could be wrong. And so that's, that's the thing that I try to get across on my channel is just, you know what, it, it's, it's good to be confident in what you believe. Absolutely. We should be confident in the gospel. Absolutely. But when it comes to eschatology, there are so many different ways that you can look at it. 
And we just need to be aware of that and not come at each other just because someone else believes something different. The, the one thing that we need to keep intact, that we need to make sure we still have in common with everyone is just the gospel. That is really what it comes down to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, first of all, I find it funny every time Paul that you said you've been in this for decades, I have to giggle <laughs> because I've been a conspiracy theorist pretty much all my life. Um, and definitely since the nineties, really, really getting through things. So I'm like, man, that is just so cute. <laughs> oh no, I, I say a decade. It's literally a decade. I started yeah, literally a in, decade in okay. 2014. Yeah, yeah, just one decade. I'm, but oh, I guess I, you know, I started in 2011, but the channel began in 2014. So it has for me been just one decade. And yeah, I only, I only say one decade. I know I'm quite young. I'm only, I'm only, I'm almost 32. You know, I'm, I'm, not, I'm, not, I, yes, I'm a baby. Yes. I'm a baby. I'm, He's a baby. But, <laughs> I know. I know. <laughs> and but but then when it comes to being a conspiracy theorist. I'm the baby because I first really started getting into this stuff in 2017. So, okay. Yeah. yeah. And that's, that's when uh, the Lord revealed biblical cosmology to us after we had the huge fires and yeah. uh, we're in the area where the big yeah. Texas fires have been lately. Well, in 2017, which hopefully I won't get in trouble from YouTube. Uh, we're just joking around here. Okay. This is not, we're not serious about any of this right now. Anyway, in 2016, our Oklahoma senator uh, introduced a bill for the evil doers, uh, those, you know, things uh, the kitties like to follow around and stuff. You guys know what I'm talking about. Anyway, uh, and then 2017, in the spring of 2017, after millions of acres had been burned, very weirdly, uh, trees and fence posts burning from the inside out uh, in 2017. And it was uh, millions of acres between Colorado, Kansas, Oklahoma, and Texas. And he came out and uh, talked to us and told us how, you know, sorry he was that this had happened and that he was going to try to get us, you know, federal help and all of that. And yeah. So anyway, what's going on today and what happened then? But that just really because we live on the Great Plains and everything's pretty flat out here anyway. But once that burned off all the extra brush and stuff, my husband and I just stood out on our hill and we were like, oh, my goodness, it's flat. And I mean, we can see 75 miles at least. And, you know, that that's not supposed to be possible. So um, very interesting. Yes. From the inside out, we had cottonwood trees exploding that you didn't even realize were were burning and it burned for a good, good hour. So uh, our oldest daughter, which I think is older than you, Paul, uh, she actually got video of them exploding escaping. I was at home at the time. And so if you guys want to see that, go over to Catherine White's channel and go down to 2017 on there and you can, you can see it. I can't watch it without tearing up at this point, but anyway, yeah, the, and the, I know who you're talking about on the eschatology and the preterism thing. And I, we have talked to them. I have interviewed his wife and he literally did start that video saying that preterism is of the devil and anybody who believes in it is going down. And uh, yeah, I, I just, I don't know if it's age or if he's been hassled. Unfortunately, I wasn't raised in the church either. Um, so, but I was saved at a young age at a vacation Bible school, but I wasn't raised in it at all. And people, the attitudes that the church, church members are mean, they will literally eat their own. And boy, you run into something that is the least bit uncomfortable for them. Uh, and, and they will woof they can get mean. And I've seen it in the churches. I've seen it in our community and boy online. 
And, and the, honestly, there's so much going on right now. So much that is being revealed to us. I mean, I kind of feel like we are in the great deception. Just, just period. We're in a great deception that everybody is realizing that they have been lied to about so many things. And, um, it, it just, pe people get that cognitive dissonance, I think. And you, you just, don't even know where to go with it sometimes, you know, and, and then people on both sides of whatever it is in the conspiracy theories tend to get uh, very obnoxious about what they believe, mm -hmm. you know, and, and I think, I think um, with, especially with Christianity, um, I try, I've been trying to think about this. Why is it the Christians that are so visceral in the reactions to this specific theory? And again, cause I, I have to try and put myself in their position because I'm out of it. I wasn't, I don't know what it's like to be raised with a specific doctrinal dogma that you were raised with, with whatever that is, you know, dispensationalism or preterism, amillennialism, I'm sure there's, there's many denominations, thousands of, den of denominations out there with different ways of doing this, you know. And I, th I think Christ preaches that it's it's truth. That's what Christianity purports to have, the truth. So I think a lot of Christians identify with their beliefs as I already know the full truth and nobody can deceive me otherwise because I have Christ type of attitude. So when someone like me or Shelley comes along and says, well, I think we may be completely wrong about where we are in the timeline. I think they take that as a real personal attack on their foundations in a way where it's kind of like, no, no, I, I know the truth. My pastor wouldn't lie to me. Why I, They know the truth. I've been I've been reading the bible more than you you're just a 20 year old child what do you know you know i know way more than you about the bible and you're just some guy on youtube my my preacher knows more than this and it's kind of he's a godly man who's you know, and they kind of have all this preconceived deep rooted dogma in them that no i cannot be deceived because i have christ and it's kind of actually you know we've all we've all been deceived <laughs> regardless of whether we all have christ or not and that's that is how the devil would do it he would let you believe you know the truth that's how it works he would he would let you have christianity he wouldn't get rid of it he would just throw you off by one degree and that over time is a huge deviation from the truth and that's all he needed to do and that's kind of what i feel has happened why i feel christians are the are the most vitriolic um, and that's just the followers of, of particular churches, leaders, though they are way worse because they have written books about the futurist es eschatology. They, they have preached to thousands of people over many years a specific doctrine and their pride is not going to allow them to to think that they have been deceived or they're wrong about something. They're not going to ba suddenly backtrack on the 20 books they've written that's on the bookshelf behind them. <laughs> you know, they, and they, they need to maintain, and sadly, it, it's money. They've made a lot of money selling one particular idea and they just can't, they can't, loot. They're, they're not going to let go of that so easily. And, um, I, just, and they've been yeah. so yeah, over-educated. I, I mean, they would have, uh, eschatology would be part of Bible study, part of, you know, Sunday school or whatever. And you wouldn't be, teaching just one way this is what revelation means you would go through the book of revelation and you would share some people think this means this some people think this means this i believe it means this because of this i mean that makes sense to me i understand you teaching what you believe to your flock but yeah the i'm so anti-dogmatic there's very, very few people, things that I will be dogmatic about. And, and that's part of the reason because people get stuck in that and their, their ego gets tied up in it. And we need to be very careful with that because the grieving the Holy Spirit, when you start saying, I'm not going to believe this because of principle, not because of facts that I'm presented or the word of God, then... And anybody else who believes it is is going to the devil or whatever. That's that's problematic. I I have issues there. Yeah, and I think it's a key to remember that Christian tradition is not always the same thing as what the Bible actually says. 
And you can find that in that different denominations have different Christian traditions. But since the people are brought up in those Christian traditions, they equate it with being exactly what the Bible says. And that's another reason that, that, like you were saying, people just accept what their pastors say without actually reading it for themselves. And very often when they do read it for themselves, they already have what their pastor said in their mind. So they go into reading the Bible with preconceived notions. You know, they already know what it is that they're supposed to think. So they're not really reading it with what we'll say is a blank slate with just what does this specifically say? And that is actually something that I tried before I was born again. I was seeking for quite a bit of time and I was still attending church where I grew up at. And I remember asking the pastor uh, a, a question that I had about Genesis. And I believe that it was because there are basically what sounds like two creation accounts, one in Genesis one and one in Genesis two. So I had a question about that and I asked the pastor about it and his wife was standing with him and she said to me, well, the Bible's not meant to be read that way. And I remember, and that was like my first clue that it was time to leave that church because how else should it be read? What, it, what was it written for if we're not to be read it? There's a certain way that you're supposed to read it. When I read a book, I just pick it up and read it. You know, I don't think that there's a certain outline that you have to follow, you know, so and and that is unfortunately that a lot of Christians are okay with that. They're okay with just accepting that we're supposed to look at things this way and this is the way it is because I learned this when I went to seminary. So, you know, well, and it's easier that way. You yeah. know, it, it's just easier that way as far as I'm concerned. The enemy has us all so busy. I, you know, that, that we don't, we can't see straight. Everybody is so busy and so stressed out with everything that's going on that I, who wants to take the time? I don't necessarily want to take the time the, all the time. You know what I'm saying? I enjoy the research and the study, but sometimes I would rather just go on about my business and enjoy ignorance, but I can't. <laughs> That's not how God's called me to do. And maybe he's called some people to do it that way. If that's how God's calling you just to concentrate on what you're doing at the moment. And I have no doubt that he does some people like that. If you've got a bunch of little children, you may need to just concentrate on them right now. You know, so and that's OK. But don't be going on people's YouTube channels and making nasty comments because God co has called you to concentrate on something different, you know, and I, I love the castle thing that Ken Ham had whenever he first started, you know, the answers in Genesis ministry and, and, you know, the Christians and then the humanists and the Christians are shooting at each other and the humanists are shooting at our foundation. And it's like, yeah, guys, we need to get back down to the foundation and we need to realize we're all on the same side. Exactly. And that's why I said, you know, Christ, he, he want, he wanted us to be united, not divided. Um, it's so much easier for the enemy to get at us. Like, like the illustration said, you know, if we are constantly at each other's throats, then we're not paying attention to what they're doing. And then on top of that, they're, they're busily chipping away at us while we're also chipping away at each other. So it's. And it's there is something to be said about the iron. And Jesus coming and saying that he did come to, you know, cause strife, not to cause mm -hmm. peace. I mean, he did that specifically. And, you know, we are supposed to be in, encouraging each other to grow. I mean, that's part of questioning mm -hmm. the narrative and having these discussions. Because I'm sure, I, I keep telling everybody, I, I don't expect to agree with everybody else or everybody else to agree with me because I don't even agree with myself on a regular basis. Yeah. So, you know, ha having us have different opinions and being on different, you know, different perspectives as we're doing this research is good. That's a good thing. Mm -hmm. I, I, mean, I, would, I would say though, sorry, sorry, Shelly. Go ahead, I interrupted you. <laughs> I, I would have never thought of the research into the clowns. <laughs> I mean, you know what I'm saying? I, I would have never thought. If God hadn't put us on different plant, you know, different paths and different perspectives, you're on something specific there that is really 
you know, amazing. Yeah. I've been swimming in clowns today. I've been writing uh, the final chapters of my book. And uh, I've just I spent like four hours today just researching really, really dark stuff about the hat man. And yeah, I mean, I didn't think I'd be talking about clowns either. I never thought I would end up being the guy talking about clowns. That was not <laughs> my plan in life at all. But it's just one of those things where it's kind of you see something, you have to say something, you know, and it, that's kind of exactly the same philosophy I'm doing with this theory as well with the with obviously the millennial kingdom. I've seen some things. I'm like, OK, I've got to kind of I've got to kind of talk about this and uh if on just on, on the millennial kingdom thing i would i would say in in focus on the positive i would say 98 percent of the time people are actually very receptive to the idea in the comments it's mainly all positive people are actually most of the comments i get are like i have never heard of this before like I, I, my brain has been tickled i've literally never even considered this angle it's kind of why and the question that you can hear you can see the cogs turning as well in in the in the comments it's kind of like why has no one mentioned this? Like, why is my, why do I not know about the little season? You can tell the like, and these neurons are starting to fire and it's kind of, this makes a lot of sense. Suddenly, yeah, most people are going down that route. The, the only ones who are really vitriolic and shill hunting and pointing fingers are the one who have somehow invested into the idea more so than it's simply just being a concept or an idea. They've, they've identified and like I said, I don't need to merge it with their ego in some way and made it a part of who they are. But um, I would say that most people are actually very receptive to the to the idea. And I'm actually excited to see the, the mass growth of this concept and what it's going to do for Chris Christendom in the future. I think I think it, I think we needed this. I think I think Christianity as a whole as a community needed a unifying idea because there's so much because when you get to like pre trib, post trib or, you know, just just the the premillennialism futurist doctrine it is so divisive because there's always a new sign that matches some symbol somewhere in revelation always happening every year and it, the day always comes and passes nothing happens we look more and more stupid more people fall away more people lose their faith then someone else sets another date and that and then books get written about that and hype gets made up about that it's just constant up and down roller coaster all in this idea of we're supposed to look for the signs and the times you know and it's kind of if if we're past all of that that is a weight off the minds of so many people in so many ways as well. And I do feel like it can we can calm down and really focus on what we need to do during this time if we are in the little season rather than always in fear of the coming end. And even they call it the end times. And if they truly believe what the Bible's saying and the doctrine that they have of futurism, it's not the end times from their perspective. It's the beginning of the millennial reign, right? So why do they keep calling it the end times? Technically, right. our new perspective here is the end times <laughs> so i don't know i just thought of throw that out there but what i'm trying to say is it, it's been majority positive i would say and i'm sure shelly can attest to that as well yeah it, it's been it's been the same you know i've I, it is mainly positive commenters for me <laughs> as a homeschool mom <laughs> I can tell by the comments if someone was not paying attention while they were watching the video or if they weren't really listening because they will comment something exactly the opposite of what I'm saying. And I think those are those are the ones that even though I have so many great comments, they do get me riled up and I try not to let them get me riled up. But again, it's the homeschool mom and me. I'm like, weren't you listening? Did you hear anything that I said? <laughs> so that's oh my gosh, Johnny to knows because I'm always I'm always oh, talking to her about it. it. Was great. And I'm like, I was totally I was totally egging her on on her mom rant. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally egging her on on the mom rant. It's like <laughs> I know. Oh, oh, Shelly, you've got every right in the world to, to give a good mom rant to these people. And, you know, she's like, I'm going to lose half my subscriber. <laughs> subscribers. So, yeah, I, I definitely think it's a majority that are much more open. We've had people that have deconstructed from the church. And there's a big part of me that feels like that's not a bad thing that that we do need to distance ourselves from some of that dogma and the preconceived notions and stuff and we need to get back to what the word actually says what was actually going on that we know of and you know get back down to the basics of things and 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 just study 
whether we think most or all of it is already done or not, we need to continue to study. Like, like Shelly said, we're bound to be wrong about something. I, I mean, we are. None of us are going to be 100% right. There were things that Jesus even said he didn't know. So, you know, and, and like my oldest says, it's battle plans. Everybody's not supposed to know about it, you know. So, yeah, definitely. Just on a, a just to inject this, just today, actually, um, Alpha Talks, Vitalia Alpha Talks, he, he covers this subject quite a lot as well. Uh, me and um, him and Joe from... Uh, JT follows JC YouTube. I've talked with about this too, and he's also kind of getting into the scene of discussing this topic. Well, I got I, um, the Vitaly sent us both a message showing the Geneva Bible of 1599. Have you have you heard about this yet? This mm -hmm. is kind of. It seems like right now everybody's talking about this just in the past like day. Everyone's my Telegram yeah. group has been posted everywhere, and it's like, have you seen this Geneva Bible with the commentary next to mm -hmm. all the things? Yeah, and you know it's written in like 1599. I think it says next to the the verse where it says Jesus says these things must shortly come to pass. This generation will not pass away. In the little side note, it says 50 years later is when he came back. <laughs> it's kind <Yeah>. of, what? <laughs> Why is this in this book? And how does this guy know this? You know, and it, <laughs> it shows that the thousand years began, you know, in like, was it 1070 or something? As you know, around that time zone, maybe 1080 or something. And then it ended in like 1040 or something like that. And he's got, it just, you read these like annotations uh -huh. here. And oh, and, and saying that uh, Satan was released during the reign of a certain pope. Yeah, yeah. So absolutely. I've been doing some research and going into that. I actually found the PDF of the Geneva, Geneva Bible with the commentary in it. And I posted it in my uh, Telegram channel. I might have posted it in your Telegram channel too, Paul. I can't remember. But, you know, that way everybody can look it up. Everybody can see what was written, but it was given specifics. Mm -hmm. And so I started looking into, okay, what is happening? Of course, I'm trying to figure out the timeline and where we actually are in the timeline. So the Geneva Bible, they say it was written in 15, whatever. But we still had I's and J's on the 15 stuff. So was it really meant, written in 500 something, mm -hmm. you know, and then the commentary written after satan was released you know is kind of where i'm thinking i don't know those are the right thoughts to have because again we don't really know the timeline and the more you look into it the more complicated it gets and yeah it's kind of, and we realize whoever wrote the history that we do have i think it's scaligarian people call it um joseph scaliger i think is the guy who we equate to writing our chronology as we know it like what he wrote is just it's just nonsense when you actually start scratching under the surface and you realize yeah we we just we really don't know how long we've been in a little season if we are in one we, we don't know if it began in the 1800s in the in maybe like the mid 1700s was it in the 1600s or was it the 1500s exactly after the fall of rome a thousand years from 500 we don't read there's, there's lots of indication that it could be any of those times when this began or when right. the millennial reign ended because there's, there's a certain events that have been documented which we can com conflate with satan being released you know the mud right. is a big a big example for in, in like the tartarian thought processes uh, i'm up for anything <laughs> i'm up for any information yeah. at all yeah you know, we haven't got it figured out and this is a team effort we are trying to iron out this process but it's that's the thing we're not saying we have all the answers we never said we did we're just saying there's clearly something wrong with what we have been told well and that's you know? where looking at the different eschatology helps i married a preacher's son and my father-in-law taught a historical perspective on the book of Revelation. So he believed the Dark Ages were the millennial reign. And he believed Jesus was reigning in heaven during that time. Um, you know, and I've got a different perspective. And I really wonder with all of the evidence that we're seeing now, what he would think about it. You know what I'm saying? But... I, it's like obviously and that was an old eschatological yeah i'm oklahoman so he you know their church had that from from the 1800s at least that idea so it wasn't anything new that he came up with on his own or anything uh but i'm sitting here okay you know 
I really think there was some time period that was added. I, and one of my big things is the, I, I'm, a, I've been doing his historical costuming. And whenever you go back, it's like people wore nothing but robes and sandals for thousands and thousands of years. And all of the sudden they invented buttons and buckles. And, and you can say that about everything. You know, you, you had this big explosion of technology just all of the sudden happen. And I'm like, seriously? It, it, no, I don't think so. I don't think so. Yeah, they were definitely, I, I believe they were more advanced than what we give them credit for. And actually going back to the Geneva Bible, because someone had sent me screenshots of it. I don't think she sent me the actual PDF, but someone emailed me screenshots. And do you remember also when I had um, someone sent me the book of the martyrs that said the year that Satan was released to? And I find all of these things so interesting. And it's like so many different pieces of the puzzle that are coming together. But I also think it's, it's, we also have to be very cautious because we don't know who wrote the notes in the side of the Bible. You know what I mean? Like I write notes in the side of my Bible. And so if someone would find my Bible, you know, 300 years from now, would they take it as absolute truth? What my opinion is that I'm writing in the side. And I'm not trying to negate what, what that says with the Geneva Bible. And I'm not even just talking about that. I'm talking about different pieces of evidence that come out like that. But I, we need to be cautious not to think that every single thing that we find is going to be absolutely true because a lot of times they were just like us trying to figure things out and coming up with their own hypotheses. So that's, that's really, I mean, and that's part of the fun part though, is because if we already knew all the answers, what, what would we do with our time? <laughs> you know, <laughs> Exactly. But, well, and we need to do the Bible that way too, because there are some scriptures in the Bible. I love the way Gary Wayne and Michael Heiser said, there's no smoking gun scripture for certain things, you know, and it, it, people will tend to take one scripture in the new Testament that really has no background that we know of anywhere else in scripture and they try to make it a, a dogmatic principle. And it's like, eh, you know, give me the context that you're trying to do this with. And I, I think we need to be careful because depending on where you're at in your life and your, your relationship with him, we can all end up having different perspectives of the scripture and different applications of the scripture in our lives. So, you know, and we need to remember that the scripture is not three dimensional. It, it's beyond us. And we need to keep that into in 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 thought too. Mm -hmm. what, what you were saying there, Shelley, as well about um, that this, this could have just been anybody making notes here, trying to piece it together themselves in this time period. I think that's that we could take that in context what you said there and it at least shows to us that these aren't new ideas that we're talking about right. today. Yes. And this is the argument we could get against us like this is just nonsense this has come out of nowhere all of a sudden and it, clearly that's because it's controlled opposition or something like that. And it's um I think this shows actually maybe predominant thought for a long time may have been the uh, the little seasonist viewpoint shall we say. And, you know, I made a video a while ago that the, the Jesus movement of the 60s and 70s, yeah. which was like a counter revolution to the counter revolution, you know, was the injection of you know, the, these this futurist doctrine. But it, it was it, obviously it was under the mask of love for Jesus and Christianity. But in the back door of that movement, they slipped in the futurist dispensationalist worldview. And that became the standard for most American churches from that point forward. Now, it's not to say that, you know, that no one had ever thought about that before. They had, but it had been solidified as the only doctrine the CEO, you know, the main, the 501c3 churches are going to get you know, and, and preach from now on. And it was in that moment as a injected counter movement to the acid 60s counter culture. it was a very odd time from what i can see and that's when those those young jesus freaks shall we call them grew up to become church leaders and they carried on that doctrine of futurism into the present day as we see it today you know but then again from that i fear as maybe there was a lot of churches prior to this who probably didn't even think about it like that they probably were more into the idea we probably are past the millennial reign or maybe they had more of an amillennialist viewpoint prior to that but what we have today wasn't necessarily always 
the, the mainstream dogma is what we're trying to say because these these notes in the side of this book show that other people in the past were thinking yeah of course we're in the little season like yeah. that just makes sense right so i i guess we can take it at least as that if oh not yeah a fact just because it's written in the side of a particular bible maybe maybe that's just yeah and I, I was actually thinking about your video about the jesus movement and i i mentioned it in one of my recent videos and you know up until about 1900 or so it was the early 1900s when the Schofield Bible was written. And so up until that point, the, the main eschatological view was historicism in, in uh, the, the Christian community. And it was around early 1900s that Schofield, I don't remember his first name, he came up with the Schofield Bible. And that was the one that primarily really started teaching futurism. And so a lot of futurists nowadays will automatically point back to the Schofield Bible, like, you know, like some people point back to the King James as being the only one that is 100% correct, you know, and I'm probably going to get some mean chats now from that. Oh, but oh, yeah. Um, yeah, and so that's the thing is that so it started in the early 1900s with the Schofield Bible, not again, not to say that they had never thought about it before, but that really took hold. And then, you know, Fast forward to, like you said, around the 60s or 70s, when this Jesus movement started, then they started using that Schofield Bible, and then it just exploded. So the, the we'll, we'll say that as of right now, futurism seems to have the corner, what is it called? The corner of the market, corner on the market, I don't know. But they, they have like the main view of of evangelical especially evangelical christianity right now but it is a relatively recent you know mm -hmm. thought process. look at what's popular from our viewpoint from a short season viewpoint if you look what's popular and what gets promoted the most what's on tbn and stuff um wouldn't it be like the enemy to promote that kind of stuff and allow that kind of stuff to get popular, to promote the books. And, you know, I enjoyed the books, the, the Left Behind series, but I read them knowing that was not the case. Yeah. And, you know, I just enjoyed them as a good biblically based fiction, you know. And I believed them <laughs> because <laughs> I read them as a baby Christian. And so everything is like hyper literal. <laughs> In, um, in that series so then as i'm reading it i'm like oh wow oh wow so it really did take me a while to come out of that but because i was not actually brought up on it i didn't become a, a christian until my early 30s so when i did read it i still didn't have that upbringing of futurism so reading that i'm like oh my gosh this is how it really is and now i'm like ah okay maybe not but it was it was you know an interesting book series but I, I know now that all right this is probably not <laughs> what it what it actually was see we never had anything like that in the uk this i've heard about this left behind series and how there's like a generation kind of raised on this this story and i, I have no i have no idea what you're talking about i literally have no idea what this is what is this can you can you just for someone like me or maybe my uk listeners the nine percent i have from my stats i've seen it, it, what is this it it's the biblical um Harry Potter of the Americans. <laughs> so it's basically taking okay. a very, very literal view. Very. It, it starts out with the rapture, with the pre-trib rapture. And all of a sudden, all of these people are just gone. And mm. so, and then it just goes through the seven-year tribulation. The main and, characters are left behind. Yeah, and so the main characters are left behind and some of them become believers um, after they were left behind. They realized, oh my gosh, my, my wife was right all this time or, you know, just things like that. And and it follows their, their separate stories. And it's just a very, very, very literal interpretation of um, the the tribulation and, and what, you know, when it says things about what, what were the creatures that have the, the locusts with the faces like what was it horses donita do you remember I in, in revelation well it was actually that like so everything that is in revelation yeah they just take it it's not symbolic it's at all it's literal. just absolutely literal and that's they, what the whole series they brought is. in an actual antichrist an actual image that the antichrist yeah, yeah. 
he actually got like Nine. shot in the head or something and yeah was, yeah the whole kit and caboodle yeah and like what, when they when uh in revelation where it says that the, the believers are sealed like they can see actual seals on it's like on a the, what 14 like books in the series i mean yeah. it's it's a big yeah I mean, it's a great fiction series to read yeah if you realize that it's fiction <laughs> so yeah you know, it's, it's inspired by the Bible. We can say that it is, you know, there are lots of movies right. that are like based on whatever, and they aren't really true to the actual story. And I think this is one of those cases. It sounds like perfect uh, propaganda for if we were in the little season, to be honest, isn't it? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, it was promoted every bit that way. It was promoted every, because Christians, the conservative Christians here in the United States, uh, they would not touch Harry Potter. Okay, with a 10 foot pole. If you read Harry Potter or watch any of the movies, you're definitely going to the devil. Um, but these left behind books were very, very, very popular. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that, that's why I compare it to that. I mean, maybe that's a good thing. Maybe it's not. I don't know. I, I'm, I'm just an Oki out here. I'm a cowgirl out in, you know, the middle of nowhere. So, can't imagine living on an island like you, like you guys do <laughs> but there's and there's actually a left behind series for children too mm -hmm. so they have one written specifically also for children and you're right about the propaganda because there were the old movies made were the ones with kirk cameron made maybe in the 90s or something and then they recently did a more like contemporary version of left behind with nicholas cage that one didn't really fall it didn't really emphasize so much the christianity aspect of it but it's a, it was a great way to get the secular world to learn about the rapture so if you're thinking about propaganda yeah that would have been yeah definitely a great tool in the toolbox mm. well uh, this is i kind of said this in a lot of videos but it seems like if if i was satan trying to deceive the nations of the little season to not know they are in the little season you would make christianity seem strong and powerful and growing and bigger than ever and you have mega churches don't you you've got on the tv you have you know, the preach the gospel being preached on television and sure the gospel sure but they always like i said it's that it's that one percent of a lie that they've kind of slipped in and by all accounts, you, you know, you look at Christianity, it seems like a huge thing. It seems like it's unbeatable and enormous and growing, right? It's one of the fastest growing religions type of thing. It's uh, always spreading to new areas and people are evangelizing new new tribes that have never even heard of Christ before. And it's, and on the, again, on the surface, it seems so strong and like, but, but yet if the foundation is completely off, if it's it's all based on this, this lie. I, and at the same know, time, there's all this decisiveness. I mean, in the 1880s, you have this split of so many denominations all of a sudden mm -hmm. because they supposedly believed that Jesus was going to come back in the 1880s and everybody was standing out on hills or whatever, waiting for him to come back so that they could go up in the clouds with him. And that started the Seventh-day Adventists, you know, all these different ones. You had the Mormons started in the 1800s and all of these different Christian denominations. And it really makes you, you know, mm. wonder. It feels like a lot of these denominations do, do do seem to have hints of the truth within them, but it's like they were created to limit people going much further or finding out much more. I think like the Jehovah's Witnesses, for example, they they believe in something similar to what we believe in a very in, in some kind of sense, but it's highly cultish, and if you become a part of it, they control every aspect of your life, you know, and that's kind of that puts people off wanting to know what they believe, for example. In Mormonism, they, they believe Jesus walked the Americas, for example, and a lot of other wild stuff, which is just completely biblical as well, on top of that. But they have these hints of the idea that there was a past where Jesus was walking the whole earth and going to these places, hinting at the Millennial Kingdom and this reign, a physical reign of some kind. Um, but again, it seems like all these factions also are just completely mixed in with a huge, gross, cult-like mentality or lie involved with it as well just pushing people away but just with all little hints of the truth and it's, again as somebody who wasn't raised with any denomination i find i can look at this holistic image and it's a terrifying image actually christendom as like a fractured group is is chaos it's all over the place it is There's it no absolutely consensus. is and, and after 
uh, trying to become part of the church after marrying a preacher's son. And we, we've been kicked out of two churches, <laughs> literally, um, because we keep digging, you know, and, and I, I've always done research. Research is just, I can't stop. I, I'm incapable of stopping. And you question things, you research things, and you try to live the way you believe God wants you to live according to the convictions he's given you. And that bothers you know, they they don't want to have to question things. They want to be able to sit in their little doctrinal beliefs and, you know, whatever they are and be comfortable in that and not even know why they're doing it half the time, you know, and yeah. I, I, get, a, I get a lot of comments from people who are telling me these stories, you know, like I, I'm trying to tell my pastor these things. I'm trying to talk with them and the church is just that the, they're like kicking me out. They refuse to speak with me. They're shutting me down. They're calling me crazy. I had one person um, who came on my last live show. He was like, can you debate my pastor for me? Can you like, just come and tell him these things? Because I tried to tell him, you know, about the, these concepts and he just laughed me out of the room and then looked at me like I was insane. And it, it's sad to hear these things. Again, I, I, when I became a Christian at first, before I knew anything like this, this millennialist stuff, you know, I did try and get into churches. I tried some local ones in the area and I didn't, again, I didn't really understand about denominations or what type of church is different from another. I was naive then, you know, baby Christian type of thing. Just trying to find a, a community of some kind, people that I could talk to who were, you know, believe that Jesus Christ is who he was, who he says he was. That's all I wanted, some fellowship, you know. But I went to these churches and it felt more like just a, um, a community meeting every Sunday where they just have some tea and coffee and chat to each other at the end of it. And I don't feel like there's anything there of value for me really and, and these they're people glorified are... country clubs anymore yeah, for the most they... part there's yeah. a few good ones don't don't get me wrong i'm sure there's a few good ones there are some good past pastors and if you're a baby christian and you need that accountability if you're trying to get you know out of addiction or anything like that and you need the fellowship and the accountability to help keep you on the path then uh, by all means you know you do what you need to do but we found we've just got our door open and we have the unchurched we have a ministry to the unchurched in our community so they know that they can come out they can come out here drunk and i'm okay i put on a pot of coffee and we visit and you know if they've got questions then we do our best and you know that's the way it should be and mm -hmm. if we're the remnant then that's how it's going to be you know what i'm saying and i i like the way we're building communities with these channels and stuff where people don't feel so isolated where they're at because most everybody does feel pretty isolated where they're at you know having that community fellowship sounds really good but in this day and age, I, God's given us the internet for a reason. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's the thing is that I, you know, I, I really do love my church. I love the people there. There is a genuine community. There are people who actually do life together, who help one another out, who interact outside of church and in church and will actually do things for the community and genuinely care about the community. With that being said, though, I don't really share my views there because I'm afraid of what they're, they're going to think. And in fact, um, my daughter's boyfriend, he actually does believe in biblical cosmology and he is a deacon at our church. And he mentioned it to some people at church that I also believe it. I'm like, why did you tell them? Because I'm like, I'm not ready for that yet because I'm just, at the point where I'm like, it, it's so nice. I This is the first church where I've actually felt an actual community. And I haven't even been there three years yet. So I wasn't ready to start kind of pushing the envelope yet. So I'm like, why did you do that? That was for me <laughs> to say. So yeah, so while I do have to say that when it comes to, you know, communities, yes. But I think that 
it, it is very, very hard to find people that are open to topics like what we're talking about. And I'm glad that my daughter's boyfriend is open to at least that. I don't know what else. I haven't really sat down and said anything to him yet, but you know, they're out there and it's just a matter of finding them. <laughs> I think, I think in America, you've got more of a choice and you will have more. So in, in England, it's, it's a very different situation for churches around here. The most of them are predominantly, um, subsidiaries of the roman catholic church you know um Angl Ang um, anglican more than anything which is like catholicism light you know and you find most of the anglican churches they have are trying to be hip and cool and and don't really talk about the fact that they're actually catholic in doctrine and that the holy roman catholic church takes precedence over everything it's it's in there if you look under on the websites and you search for it you know it's all there but even then what they discuss in even in like let's say the Protestant churches or the Church of England and these places, it's it's all milk. It's n none of it's meat. They don't, yeah. it's just all love, happiness, love Jesus, which is great. And then that's it. Sing a few songs and go home. And that's it. Just every Sunday, they just do that. And it's kind of, <laughs> this is nothing. You guys, you have no idea what's going on, yeah. do you? I'm like, I'm looking at them all say, you haven't got a clue. You literally, this is as great as it is that, you know, you have a belief in Jesus. You have no idea what's happening in the world. Like you, you have, yeah. and they don't care. They don't want to know. And you know, when it came to things like that event, we're not allowed to talk about from twenty twenty that affected the whole world. They were all complicit with whatever the government said to do. They were all, it's, it's. They're just. I don't know. I would. I wouldn't call them a real. I know it's hard to say. And again, some lovely people. I met some lovely people, but I wouldn't call them a church. I don't know what that is exactly. In America, what you sounds like what you have is way different. Yeah, that's all I'm saying. Like, I there are like some it... churches like that here. There are a lot of churches like that here. Mm. I would say most of them. The one that I grew up at was very, very Catholic, but by a Protestant name. So I didn't go yeah. to a Catholic church, but yes, it was very much like a Catholic church. The one that I'm at now, though, not like that in the slightest. In fact, my pastor has talked about Genesis 6 and who the Nephilim really were. And he has talked, he's even brought up the gap theory um, from between Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 1-2. So he does talk about things that most other pastors won't touch. Mm. Um, just he hasn't gotten as deep as I as I would like that that he would have, but he's definitely done far more than any of the other churches that I've ever been at. So I mean, they're they're out there, and I think that it, in many cases, they just have to maybe become not afraid. I think some pastors are just afraid because of what their congregations will think. But you know, we we need to just encourage them that you know the truth. That's mm -hmm. that's more important than what the congregations think. So I, I think some of it is the 501c3 because they want to keep their funding and then, you know, being afraid of what to say to keep seats, keep pews warm, you know, mm -hmm. and I, I think that's that's a lot of it. But it's also convenient for them as well. I, I mean, truthy churches out here are very few and far between and some families will drive a long way to go you know a, a two three four hours drive to to go to a church where they are with like-minded people and in most of the churches out here if you look i they've pled fealty even like the holy roll roller stuff the full gospel movement they went to the vatican and pled fealty to the pope oh in, in the early 2000s yes they did and uh kenneth copeland was one of one of the ones that went yes wolves in sheep's clothing oh yeah oh yeah oh yeah so, well, in light of the uh, millennial kingdom theory, I, I've I've heard a lot of people telling me now this is all just evidence that the Roman Catholic Church is the one true church, and you should be following it because you know if if you believe that. These I've churches, got Catholic you know, friends who absolutely admit that there are issues with the present Pope and things going on in the church. Um, you know, and and I totally believe they're as Christian as I am. They're in the Word. They love the Lord. You know. Um, it, it's not up to me to say where you go or where you don't go, you know, and how you do that. As long as you are working on your relationship with him, that's what's important, mm -hmm. you know, and 
yeah, it, it's, oh my goodness. I, think, I mean, <laughs> we could probably go on and on on that one. We probably <laughs> could. <laughs> yeah, well, all I'm, I'm not here to bash um, Catholics. My, 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 right. grandma, my, my grandma's a Catholic. You know, I went to, I went to some Catholic churches when I was a child. I get it, you know, and these are generally good people. They're not like out to deceive or anything. And, and I get that, you know, and everyone's got their own way of, doing these things and, and as a non-denominational i'm not here to pass judgment on to anything like that but what i'm saying in light of this millennial kingdom theory there does seem to be actually some uh validity to the to the church as it used to be the true apostolic succession of the millennial reign where the saints would have been around perhaps in cathedrals if you want to go that far so people theorize some of them aren't some of them are maybe the gothic cathedrals were the ones from the millennial reign or something like that i don't know i've heard many other theories but it, it may explain practices like why they pray to saints, which to us sounds absurd because they're dead and you're supposed to go straight through Jesus. You don't need to pray to dead people like saints, for example. But if the saints were actually around and are not dead, but actually in the camp of saints currently alive on earth, maybe there's this, there is something to this. There had to have been know. some kind of governmental um, authority and situation, you know, saints would have been like maybe lords or representatives yeah. at the time. And maybe they weren't actually praying to them during that time, but would go to them. Had, you know, so while he was actually here reigning, I'm sure there was some kind of an authoritarian, you know, system that we don't know about. And it would have been up to Satan to twist that up and and turn it into something wrong which is right. what we have today which is this weird horrible thing today which i wouldn't call christianity necessarily um i mean they've changed the ten commandments first of all so to me that's a huge red flag uh they, they're just just to add idol worship in there and make it okay you know and I, right. I, this, this so what i'm saying today isn't it i'm not saying the catholic right. church today exactly. is the one true church i am not saying that right i'm saying they these are squatters in a in an infrastructure which may have actually been a part of the original church during right. the millennium, during the millennium. And I have struggled yeah. with like the images, you know. And okay, during the millennial reign, I I mean, in the tabernacle, I, he said in the Ten Commandments not not to make images, right? And but in the tabernacle, we've got the images on the the mercy seat of the angels. And then he told them to embroider angels on the curtains and, and things like that. So I'm like, what was the actual precedent for that? And are the statues and things that are actually like inlaid in buildings and things, was that more of a reference? You know, I can see where some of the carvings maybe are uh, like a library, like it's telling a story. Definitely in India where there's carvings on things, you know, that's that's like a library, it's telling a story. Um, so was it something like that or were some of those, and very likely some of those added later? I think, to, it's, a bit of, I think it's a bit of both from what probably. I've seen. Um, I've seen in real time, you know, I went to Lincoln Cathedral not that long ago. And um, just next to the cathedral are the masons who are constantly renovating and re-sculpting and replacing the stones, carving out new ones, you know, and and you can see them. You can see brand new, fresh uh, dragons that they've created with tongues sticking out with monster demons on the end. And you can tell that was made maybe a year ago. You just look at it compared to the stone right next to it, which clearly has like 300 years worth of weathering on it. This is the stark difference. So they're always replacing and updating the cathedral that's interesting because here they're just defacing everything mm. but, you know they but, tear it down or it that, has a fire yeah yeah well yeah that we've had that too <laughs> but I, I, i've tried to theorize why america had all these fires but in europe we only had a few it wasn't that big of a deal you know everything wasn't burning down we had london bridge which burned down which if you see images of london bridge what that thing used to look like it was not just a bridge it was a city. It was nuts, right? But uh, but you know they picked that up brick by brick, shipped it across the ocean, and brought it over here. We have London <laughs> Bridge over here, you know. Well, well, 
But the, the thing is, I think because obviously the new world shouldn't have had all these buildings. That's probably why they right. had to burn them all down. But Europe yeah. has this long, rich thousand year history. So we can make sense of these buildings a lot more easily. You know? And so, some of that maybe when the dragon was released and a third of his minions were thrown down from heaven, maybe that started a bunch of the fires as well. Maybe it's where they landed and and started a fire. Maybe. I mean, maybe. I mean, there's that Nuremberg event, isn't there, in like 1566 or something like that, which was literally a war in heaven above them with orbs flying all over the place and all sorts yeah. of insane things. Who knows what's happened throughout the past? In the yeah, history. and if you they know. took, if they put, if they smunched 300 years in there, mm. if 1566 and 1766 were actually the same year and they you know, or 1866, something like that. Mm -hmm. If they added a time period and stretched that out, we know that Egyptologists have done that for Egypt. You know, uh, Patterns of Evidence did a really good job of showing how they stretched the timeline for Egypt. So who's to say they haven't done it? Oh, they definitely have. And so, so thinking of um, the, you were saying about the, when the angels fell, and you would just mention the year 1866. That's the year that that happening happened that they call it the night the stars fell. And that happened over the United States. So it's just and then the again, yeah, the fires happened in the 1800s. You have this event in 1866 called the night the stars fell when, you know, all of these supposed just like lights are, are in the sky. And people thought it was the end of the world. Like they actually thought it was the end. And so that's that's an interesting concept. I never thought of that, of it being ignited. You know, the fire's being ignited, so to speak, from that. That's that's a neat theory. Mm. It would certainly create enough force, wouldn't it? Something falling from heaven, I suppose, enough uh, of an impact, perhaps, to start fires. Uh, I'm always amazed. I don't know. I remember years ago, there was um, people talking about these, these huge stone spheres that are just all over the earth in, like, mass just loads of them together in random places and they've got the story well you know that's weathering over thousands of years of water erosion creating perfect stone spheres just in the middle of forests and on, on beach fronts and stuff then you have to wonder you have these stories of stars just falling out of the sky <laughs> it's kind of are these this what's left of them <laughs> just these balls all over the place you know and I don't know. That's just a wild speculative theory there. I don't know if that's the case or not, but that's kind of what we have to do with this theory. We have to try and look at these things from the past, like these stone balls I, I learned about seven years ago. And now looking at it through this lens, it's like, well, this actually could could explain what these things are that are come crashing down at some point. And maybe these were the stars. Maybe the stars we see today are only just a fraction of what was originally there. You yeah. know? And it was actually way more than we can understand. And this is another thing. Uh, if these events have, have happened and a third of the stars have already fallen you know, through the whole tribulation event, we can't actually trust the signs in the heavens we see today and apply them to the biblical narrative necessarily because, first of all, wandering planets are not, are not supposed to be wandering. So how can we trust where they're going to be as any sign from God whatsoever? You know, when, when Saturn's in a specific star sign or something like that, well... The wandering stars have a punishment for what they're doing. You know, they're, they're angels who left their first estate. They're, they're rebellious angels, essentially. You know, you shouldn't be dictating or living your life based on star signs or the pattern of things in the sky currently. And, you know, people right now are all hyped up over the coming eclipse, for example, which is on April 8th, which is supposed to go through seven cities called Nineveh or something like that over America. And people are saying, oh, well, the new Madrid fault line is going to get triggered. It's going to be earthquakes, it's going to be huge disasters. And it's kind of, everyone's saying it's biblical. This is signs of the end. This is signs of tribulation. And I'm thinking, well, you know, what a coincidence they've named all these cities Nineveh and also they've called it Devil's Comet at the same time as the eclipse. It's kind of, could, could they not just be naming these things in advance to orchestrate these events that we're calling end time signs of tribulation? <laughs> this, I'm I, roll, especially I'm when you consider the people that are making these apps and coming up with these, you know, online stellariums and stuff like that have got to know the biblical cosmology and understand the book of Enoch in order to make a app that actually works. So they're lying to you about how, 
how the app is actually laid out in order for that to even line up to begin with. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. There, there's just so much, there's so much there. And, you know, whenever we would talk about the great deception, like years ago, or when we would think about it, a lot of people always thought that the great deception would be focused on like one, one deception. And I, I never in my life imagined that the deception would be in everything, like not just one focused thing, but in every single thing around us, we, we are lied to about everything. And you can't get much of a greater deception than that. Yeah. No. No, uh, we had no idea how how huge this actually would be. Every, everything's inverted. Everything yeah. that we are taught is is just been turned on its head head perfectly. You know, you talk about the uh, biblical cosmology, for example, as one of these major waking up points for a lot of us in the truth movement. You know, I, I saw when that rose, and even when I started to get into that, I, I I have my flat Earth degree. I got it years ago. You know, I did all the research with everybody else. You know, and I I graduated, and I, I felt like I've kind of moved on from that a bit now. My focus isn't on that. A lot of people never left it behind and have kind of hyper focused on it and still obsess over it today. But I kind of moved on from that. It's like that's one deception. Yes, it's real. Let's go on to the rest of it. You know, and you realize yeah. we've been lied to about you know the shape of everything is inverted. Um, the food that they tell us is healthy is actually killing us. Um, they say tell us CO two is bad for us. It's actually what plants need to grow. It's all, everything's kind of just the complete opposite and now i've been told oh well actually you know we're not waiting for tribulation we're actually it's already happened we're way past that as well <laughs> it's kind of just one thing after another every institution has just been completely lied to and you have to wonder as well is it, is it just this is a highly western christian view i'm giving here are people in other cultures in other countries with different religions also have everything just turned upside down from what they originally believed as well are they having the same issues we're having are all their histories completely messed up in light lies as well or do they actually have it all mapped out because they're not i don't don't, we have to ask them because i don't speak many other languages unfortunately unfortunately but i bet i bet we're not the only ones i bet in india they have the same issues that we're having with their histories that just don't make any sense i bet china's histories don't make any sense whatsoever as well i bet if we go around and anyone who speaks these languages who's listening go and ask let me know let me know (laughs) give me some comments i I love watching like pravi mohan i i don't know if you follow him i mean so close to where we're at on so many things and it, it's really enlightening to see all of the stuff that he's bringing up we do a lot of digging into the old myths and legends around the world and stuff it's getting to a point where the older stuff the old folklore and myths and legends are actually making sense from a biblical Mm. perspective and laying it out. And it's easier to talk to some of these people now because they're seeing it, you know, and it's like, Oh, you can say, you can say to him, Hey, have you read the book of Enoch? You know, you don't even have to take them directly to the Bible because some people, you know, you have a little not wanting to go there, but it's like, have you read the book of Enoch? Because the book of Enoch talks about a lot of this stuff you can you can pull the norse mythology into it the chinese mythology into it and all of that and bring it all together and so i think a lot of this that we're bringing out it doesn't matter if you started out a christian or not all these other religions can see a lot of the same thing if they've got their eyes open and and I, we've all got the same architecture Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. so whereas I know for us, we were taught in Japan, they have a certain kind of architecture in China. They have a certain kind of architecture and, you know, in different places. And of course, South America didn't have any architecture. <laughs> Whenever I grew up, there was oh, yeah. nothing but a bunch of savages down there. <laughs> and they they'll thought, tell you it's colonialism that's what they like to say oh it's yeah. because of colonialism and then if you look it up you're like no not all of the co- the countries that had this architecture were actually colonized well so, I know. Well, what, do you, what do you say about those yeah in the homeschooling at first we thought the monks came over and built a church on anything fun okay ah build a church on it you know the monks built it and then I started seeing some of the churches and bridges and things that are in South America. And it's like, 
how did some monks and conquistadors build that on the side of a cliff over no <laughs> you know it's like no i i cannot no with donkeys or just or like more? you know the star forts like the one in california it's like oh yeah that was built by coal miners what the star <laughs> fort was built by coal miners they had these like highly advanced freemasonry not freemasonry but masonry skills these techniques but they were coal miners it's oh, like and all on. of this like, stuff, just come all on. of this stuff that the mormons built within like what 20 years of arriving in salt lake city they built Oh, wow. I mean, they were industrious. They were not only having lots of children by lots of wives. They were industrious in the process. I mean, they had way more energy than I've got. Yes. So, they were all architects and masons. Every last one of them. Every apparently. last one of them. <laughs> uh, yeah. Just, just um, bringing it back here to something else I actually want to talk to you about, Shelley. Um, so there was a huge expose of this. I don't, I don't want to call it preterism. Okay. I feel like pr personally, I think you can agree with me. Preterism is the straw man they're attacking to debunk what we're trying to say. And I don't think necessarily what this is, is, is preterism as it's classically understood. I think it, most preterists don't even believe in a physical kingdom, really. And, and a, a millennialist kind of falls slightly into the preterist worldview a little bit. And it's, it, the lines are blurred. But the argument always is, oh, well, you know, preterism was created by a Jesuit. And you covered this, you know, and, and, and you did a brilliant job. And as soon as I heard that argument, I was like, that's a pretty weak argument on many, many, many levels. My first one is just because a Jesuit formalized the concept doesn't mean he created the idea that Christ has already come and ruled. He's just somebody who said it, who happens to also be a Jesuit. I mean, I, I believe that my first response was, no, the person who created this was Jesus when he said, this generation will not pass away <laughs> before yeah. all these things come to pass. You know, the, it was when Jesus said repeatedly, I come quickly, the time is at hand, seal not the message in these scrolls, go and tell everyone, John, because it's serious, I'm about to come back now. So that's when his Jesus himself created this concept and gave the idea to us, not some Jesuits in like the right. 1600s. <laughs> no, and you know, you know that particular thing, and was not um they 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 weren't particular broadcast was not the norm when you've got somebody who has an extensive library like like they do and at their fingertips and usually preaches scripture you know and just brings these other things in for context, but starts with the extensive library. And I didn't watch the whole episode because I got frustrated, but I don't know if there were any scriptures actually presented or I know people in the comments were trying to present scripture and they were being ignored. That's not the norm for those people. And I feel like there's they've probably been heckled. You know, and, and some some people have been given a certain message and we don't need to push another message on. It is like you were saying about the, you know, the biblical cosmology. You've already got your diploma and you're moving on. Right. And some people aren't there yet. They're starting at a different place. And when we're all kind of starting at different places, we've got different perspectives and stuff that. <sighs> I, I can appreciate the knowledge that those people have, but obviously they weren't on their game for that broadcast. And I'm going to pray for them. I have been, <laughs> you know, because I, we can all get off on a tangent sometimes. It's, I mean, it wasn't just them. 
I hear it a lot. This, uh, the go-to put-down of this theory is, you're a praetorist. Praetorism was created by a Jesuit. This is all just the, um, the product of satanic thinking. You know, this is satanic doctrine because of the Jesuit argument. And again, for what they did, fair enough. That's that's their knee-jerk reaction opinion. I'm not really focused on any particular channel here. I'm just saying those who make this argument, I'm saying it's not a very strong argument. Like, I didn't get to my opinion on this matter because of what Jesuits wrote. I right. got to my opinion on the matter by reading Revelation 7 and then backtracking back through the Gospels and reading Jesus' words for what he actually said. That's how I got to the opinion, not through the, the obscure writings of a, of, a, of, a re, of, a, of a very old or group of specific people, that. you know. I mean, and, you know, yeah, we run into other YouTube channels that give different perspectives. And sometimes that's your jumping off point to, oh, my goodness, I need to study this mm -hmm. because I, I haven't seen this perspective. Yeah. Um, but who's going in specifically looking at Jesuit stuff to try to find, mm -hmm. you know. it it I, I find that it's it's kind of comical because it's almost like. Even back then, in the 1500s or so, or whenever, whenever, whenever the Jesuits supposedly came up with both preterism and futurism, which they tend to leave out, because mm -hmm. many of the people calling preterism like you know the doctrine of demons and stuff, they're actually futurists, and they're kind of leaving out the part that Jesuits also supposedly created futurism too. Um, but it's kind of like it's it's almost like a childish game, you know. Nowadays they say, oh well, flat Earth was created by the CIA. And it's like, well, no, it wasn't, you know, because look at look at the cosmology of all of these other ancient civilizations. And just like what with Paul was saying, you know, well, preterism was created by the Jesuits. No, it wasn't. It, it was Jesus in, in God's word. So it's if they, they try to discount things by attaching labels to them or these stigmas by saying that, oh, well, this group created that that group created that. Not because it actually has any merit, but because they know that a lot of people, once they hear that, will be like, oh, no, no, I'm not going to listen to it then. Because even in my comments, like, oh, well, if it was created by the Jesuits, then I'm definitely not going to pay attention to it. And I'm like, well, that's the thing, though. First of all, you don't know if it was actually created by the Jesuits because they're, they lie about everything now. I'm certain that they were lying about a lot then, too, you know, and again like like he said foundationally where did it begin not the jesuits so mm -hmm. I, I get a lot of comments coming in lately after after what they did you know and um it's like you should probably know this you can hear the smugness in the voice like you do know the jesuits came up with this right you should go and watch this video they lay it out very clear and oh, yeah, it's it was kind emailed of like... to me and everything <laughs> yeah. and, and it's like kind of people like... throwing around the esoteric word oh you're being esoteric you're you're and it's like you don't even know what esoteric means <laughs> <laughs> no. i i actually i got a very interesting email a couple of days ago um I'm going to have to, I'm not going to read the whole thing because it's, it's very long and convoluted, but I'm going to get it up just so I can get the gist of what this is. But this was an odd one, and I've, I've not had one like this before. I'm not going to name any names here of who sent it, but it, the title was odd. Everything everything about this is just strange. You'll you'll agree with me once I, I kind of get into this, but uh, where is the title of this one? Right, so they've titled it Expanding horizons beyond gatekeepers and rediscovering history. That's what they titled this email. And then they says, you know, I've been following your channels for a while because of the demons are clowns theme. However, I've also been paying attention to the shift you're making into other topics, such as lost history and the associated notion that the millennial ray may have already occurred. I was already somewhat familiar with these topics before they appeared on your channel. Primarily, I want to offer you a warning and some broadening of your horizons as I have a strong feeling that you're currently getting sidetracked and gathering people around you who want to keep you in a circle. <laughs> I call them gatekeepers, in quotes. On one hand, you've indeed found something, but unfortunately, it's likely only half the truth. Doesn't it strike you as odd that all these discoveries about lost history, strange occurrences in the past that we hadn't heard of until a few years ago, including photographic material that seems technologically ahead of its time, are suddenly coming to light. 
Suddenly everything comes out and people are rushing to piece it all together into real history. The information you have about our past covers even more topics which you're leaving out. Since the original material spreading into this also includes flat earth, mountains or trees, and we live in a previous exploited world, and that the moon is a map of our world, etc. Now to the point of why I'm writing you all this. I think you should broaden your horizon, which might give you slightly different perspective on everything, and not waste your time in streams going around in circles with gatekeepers, as it leads nowhere. You've read your Bible, blah 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 blah, and they send me two random links to videos that I cannot understand, that they make no sense, with some reference to Breaking Bad, or something like that. And... It's just, it's the condescending tone in these emails I get that I can't stand the most. Like, Paul, you need to broaden your horizons. You're clearly just swimming around with gatekeepers. You're you're just falling for the stupidity around you. And you've got some good stuff. I like what you're doing. You know, it's, this is all right over here. But but you really you really should just focus more on this instead and and leave that stupid stuff behind. It's kind of who, part of my phrase, who the hell are you? <laughs> like to tell me what I can and cannot think about, and that, and to assume that I am, I have fallen for some stupid trap, and that people are corralling me into a weird circle to control me. And it's like you do realize I'm the one who's reached out to these people myself to talk with them. We're just human beings having conversations here, and it's I, I don't know. This, I'm this so the... <laughs> glad I'm not the only one because I, I get emails and comments like that all the time. And it is, Donia knows all about them. <laughs> and it's so frustrating to me. The other day, I got some kind of comment saying that I've been following your channel for some time and I really enjoy your videos, but I think that you're starting to research too many things now and you are getting yourself confused. Yeah. And it was basically saying that if I stop looking into all these things, I will find peace. And I'm like, I will find peace by being ignorant and not knowing, like by believing lies. How is that? That's not true peace. You know, the the word of God is all about truth. So how am I going to find peace by just ignoring things? And it was just, and it's just comments like that, that I'm like, wow. And yeah, and, and the emails telling me what I should and should not post about and yeah i wonder if it's the same people going to it must be it must be because I, I get like at least maybe 10 of these a month and they're always long along that same line i really like what you're doing here but shut up about this <laughs> that's basically what it's always a, and it's, sometimes it's the other way around it's like oh i really like the millennial kingdom stuff but that that clown stuff's insane you need to leave that behind <laughs> it's kind of yeah i, I don't know I don't, I can't wait. I can't, I can't please anybody. The comments that say that they like a variety. <laughs> well, yeah, I know. And yeah. I, I mean, I, I'm not looking to be a one trick pony. I, I like no. to, to talk about a lot of things. I like to. I variety I, I, is the spice yeah. of life. And we're learning. Exactly. So you're yeah. going to be learning new things. And that's the idea. I don't ever want to become stagnant. Yeah. On, on, and just say, okay, I've learned it all. I'm done. You know? Mm. That that I don't ever want to be to that point. Even in heaven, I'm I'm expecting to. I want to be a librarian. Oh yeah, <laughs> there's such a thing, you know. If I can sweep the 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 floors of the library or do the dusting or whatever, you know. I know some people don't believe there'll be dust in heaven. So anyway, I I just want a job in there. That's that's what I want because I want to keep learning all the time. Hmm. We'll yeah, and, and that um, there was another comment that I had that was just listing how I had gone astray and I was confused about this thing and I was doing this wrong and I was on the wrong place. And then it ended the the comment was saying, but you're doing a really good job and I enjoy your <laughs> channel. And I'm like, how do I even respond to that? Mm. It's like gaslighting you, isn't it? Yeah. You know? I get, it is. It is. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Oh my goodness! Hey, yeah. <laughs> I, I, again, I, I'm, I'm baffled. I don't usually respond. I just don't respond because I don't, I don't know what to say. I mean, to a comment like that as well. I mean, I have, I have to say, look, I've been doing the clown thing for like eight years, okay, and I'm still going now. I've just been talking about this topic for six months. I am not finished. Okay, yeah. <laughs> don't tell me I've, that's enough of that. Leave it alone. It's like I'm gonna, I'm probably gonna be doing this for another ten years, you know, as well as everything else. You don't just stop 
Yeah. Like there's no stopping point here. Once you once you start a ball rolling. And I don't think people just... understand in the slightest being a creator on YouTube, having a blog, whatever, is not an easy thing. It's a job in and of its own. And you know, even if you're not editing, because I hate editing, um editing. you're just posting your stuff, it takes energy to do this. You know, it, it takes a lot and it, just coming up with thumbnails and the descriptions. I can write a whole book, but sitting there trying to come up with a decent title and description will take me a day. Just about. It, it's the pit. So and the research, the research. Oh, is the endless. research takes forever. So yeah. time consuming. It's like, yeah, it feels like that's all you're doing. And then that's all you have on your mind. And it's just mm -hmm. it's it doesn't end. Yeah. Yeah. And then life on top of that. And and so it just, you know, pray for us, people. <laughs> you know, I we definitely aren't sitting here acting like we've got I'm not trying to act like I've got it all together. I know neither one of you are. Um, we're learning and we're sharing what we're learning with you. If you don't like something, move on. I've tried to tell people if you don't like me eating while well, I'm because I, I'm trying to keep my blood sugar going. So I'm usually eating and I make noises and we've got dogs in the background. This is real life here. And I do the best I can to put on, you know, a, a semi-professional production. But th this is what, and then you got the promo. Are you promoting yourself, you know, promo promoting yourself? much and i'm like i've got a new book out i'm going to promote it yes i am some people are interested and i'm going to tell people about it and if you want to buy it great if you don't fine you don't need to leave a comment about it if you don't want to watch the video don't watch the video that, you know? I, it's like they don't understand that you can scroll past a video you don't have to click on it just because it's there in front of you if you don't like what the subject is Go watch something else. And I'm yeah. totally fine with that. I mean, are these same people, Shelly, I mean, almost every other video that you do is a homeschooling video. And I know not all of your followers are homeschoolers. You know, are they, and I'm past the homeschooling years, so I don't watch your homeschooling videos usually. You, you know, I skip past the ones that I'm not interested in. Yeah. And, and, and as, as a creator, and as both of you are creators, we're totally fine with that. We don't expect, you know, all of our subscribers to watch every single one of our videos. I'm subscribed to hundreds of channels. There's no way I could watch every single one of their videos. So I have to be very, very picky and choose specifically the things that interest me. And if the topic that I'm covering that day is something like, eh, you don't need to leave a comment about it. <laughs> Just go watch something else on another channel. It's fine too. It doesn't have to be on my channel. Just go find something that does. Whatever happened to the, you know, the old adage of you don't have anything nice to say, don't say anything at all. Like from Bambi. Yeah, that was in Bambi. <laughs> I, I don't mind some constructive criticism. I have had some people give me admonishment that I deserved and I'm okay with that. And I've even made videos about that and I, I'm okay with, you know, legitimate admonishment and constructive criticism. I'm okay with that. Um, but if you're just telling me that my hair looks funny today or whatever, move on, move on. <laughs> But it's odd. I find most of my criticism isn't necessarily always what I'm talking about. It is the petty, weird things like, oh, is this another re-upload? I swear I watched this last week. Why are you doing... Oh, you're promoting your book again? <laughs> These type of things. And it's like, well, yeah, I'm going to I'm gonna shill my own book on my own YouTube channel. Yeah, that's going to happen. Yes, I'm going to cut 20-minute segments from two-hour-long talks and release them in shorter versions because not everyone watches two-hour-long talks. Right. I'm allowed to do that on my channel, but it's got to get these people who like kind of dictate to you how you should be doing things. And, you know, I, they don't understand, as you were saying, I actually have a lot going on behind the scenes. I can't make a new video every single day. That's just fresh content because I have a serious health problem that I'm dealing with. That I'm currently getting treatment for. It's kind of you, we have lives, you know, and it, it's easier for me to make re-upload a segment of a larger show than it is to spend 10 hours 
creating a brand new video with images and recording the audio, the editing process to make five minutes worth of, of something fresh with, with images can take like two hours just for five minutes, you know, and these yeah. are like half an hour long things. I don't think they quite understand. They think it's easy. I think we have this assumption that what we do is just, oh, you just press play and say some stuff and upload it. There's nothing to it, right? To make the thumbnail for this talk alone, because there's because there's no direct topic and I thought we were going to be talking about. I spent like a good hour making just a thumbnail <laughs> just before going live, and it's kind of they yeah. don't they don't see that side of things. They don't kind of understand the the choices we have to make. And someone's in my comments made me laugh here. They said because I have a I have a weekly show called the Truth of Therapy Sessions, and they've just said this is a real Truth of Therapy session. What we're doing right now, and I thought that was quite funny. <laughs> like, we're just good, good, yeah. Yeah. I know. Honestly, we need it, right? We need it. We are all dealing with things. And yeah, it's nice getting to do it face to face because usually I'm just messaging Donita complaining. <laughs> <laughs> I I love having friends all over the world that are are sharpening me and challenging me, and I can wake up in the morning with a prayer request or sharing a prayer request with them you know, that we can get past the, the, the 10 hats and, and, you know, and, and, and enjoy it. This is supposed to be an adventurous journey. Don't get tangled up in, in the weeds here, you know, enjoy the journey and, and pick and choose the things that you can handle chewing on and then spit out the bones and, and keep walking if that's what you need to do. And, you know, if God has, like I said, if God has given you something specific that you need to be concentrating on and you can only do bits and pieces of this, that's fine. That's absolutely fine. I, I'm a very politically active person. And for several years in my life, I, I there was a time when I had three in diapers and was taking care of my father-in-law who had dementia uh, on top of my own health problems. And I could not be politically active at that point in time. And there's very little on my blog from that period of time. I had to concentrate on what God gave me as a priority during that time. And, and we all, you know, need to do that. We are in a broken world. No matter where we are in the timeline, we are in a broken world. And they, we've got a lot against us right now, you know, and uh, we need to be working together and praying for each other and helping each other out instead of judging every little thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know? Amen. Absolutely. Amen to that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, just one thing I want to talk with you guys about, actually, just a, a bit of a segue now. Um, okay. Just if you've, got, if you've got the time, but I saw you two made a video talking about, was it RH negative? And you mm -hmm. were kind of trying to pass that idea out. And people are asking me about this all the time. And we I'm did gonna... two, actually. We did one on Shelly's channel and we did a follow-up answering some questions on mine mm -hmm. as well. Yeah, because for me, blood has actually become quite an interesting, for my own life, like it's not something I've really ever thought about until recently, but I have to get weekly venisections right now where they take... Um, a bag of blood out of me every week to get my iron level down because by ferritin it was at like organ damaging high levels wow. and and um i have a genetic condition now called hemochromatosis where i don't process iron like normal people it just accumulates and then it gets stored in my heart and my liver and then it becomes toxic and the, the only way to cure it well not cure it's never going to get cured but the only way to handle it is to drain your blood regularly to keep the iron down because you need to use iron to make new red blood cells so it uses it you know if you take the blood out make new red blood cells brings your iron levels down because they're using it so that's kind of what i have to do but i found out i'm i'm all negative okay and i don't know what that means exactly but i saw you guys were talking about this rh factor i remember years ago i mean i'm talking like eight years ago when i first started this was all the rage this topic and i i've kind of forgot what it was all really about can you teach me now or give me a quick power 10 minute lesson on what what's the big deal about this rh negative and the blood type thing go for it shelly what have you got <laughs> Thanks, what have you got Sonia. about this <laughs> throw me under the bus 
Um, well, really, the, the the negative aspect just means that it's missing a, a protein called the rhesus protein. And a lot of people think that the, the rhesus protein is actually coming from the rhesus monkey, when in fact, it's it's just named after that, that monkey, but the protein itself has nothing to do with the actual monkey. And so when the, the blood is missing that protein, it's that it becomes more common for people with RH negative blood to experience um, different things like MTHFR was one of the things. Now, you don't have to be negative to have the MT MTHFR genetic mutation, but it just means that there are certain um, certain things that your blood either handles better than RH positive or that handles worse. And it, it's just really on how it handles different things. Now, there's a lot of theories that RH negative blood is actually the, the pure blood, the way that it was meant to be, you know, when God created Adam and Eve. And we we have no way of, of actually knowing that. And there's a lot of, you know, just conspiracy theories going around about RH negative blood um, just being connected to the, the Nephilim bloodlines. And some people say that that's where the term blue blood comes from, because if you do actually look into RH negative blood, um, it's associated with, with royal families and noble families. They are very, very careful to, to continue this, this bloodline. And so they say that that's where the term blue blood comes from because they claim that RH negative blood is higher in copper rather than iron, which you have just proven is not true. Um, and so they're, they're saying that that's why it's called blue bloods because the copper in, in the, the negative blood, negative blood makes it actually blue. Mm. But if you actually look into that RH negative blood is, is not blue, you know, just like RH positive blood is not blue. So, you know, I, as for like the medical aspect of it, I, I'm not really well versed in, in all of the, the differences, but I, I do know that O, o negative is the, uh, that's the universal blood, right? Can't that go to anybody? Yeah, I can, donate, sure I can donate to anyone at all, positive or negative. It doesn't matter. Yeah. If I was O positive, I can only donate to all the positives. Yeah. And that's how it works, basically. And then you get, when you start getting into other blood types, it gets really complicated who you can and can't donate to. But me personally... Anyone can take my blood. I can't take anybody's though. Mm -hmm. I have to have O negative. I think that's how yeah. it works. If I needed the same thing, um, but again, I don't. I've never. I don't hold much weight to the whole. It's in the blood thing, and your blood type yeah. matters, and it's important, especially when it comes to salvation. I don't think it. Yeah. It oh matters no. Yeah. At all. Absolutely. And I think you can. You. It's. I think it sets dangerous precedents when people start going down that route. It's like, well, you've got Nephilim blood, so you're an evil person, and. Yeah. How how you know how does that stop a crazy person from getting to the logical conclusion of well I need to kill everybody with RH then because <laughs> they're yeah, all Nephilim it, you know it's like a Holocaust all over again you know yeah. Yeah. yeah and I think we're not saved by our blood that's not you know was and I think it does it, it's irrelevant now and, I, yeah. and getting on the Nephilim topic because I love that topic too it's what my book is half my book is about you know I think you you could argue we're probably all a little bit in some way corrupted now. Yeah. in some way you know it's oh, so, yeah. so long far into the future so much breeding and mixing and, and that that's at why... this point we probably all have abraham blood and we probably all have some Raphaim blood maybe i mean i'm not saying we do what i don't know but it's likely i'm pretty sure all of us americans because we're all heinz 57 sauce and we got a <laughs> lot of everything going on over here oh, exactly so, you know it's it's been so long now that it would you i think you would be hard pressed to find a pure adamic human let's say you know i think you would yeah. be really hard pressed and that's why it doesn't matter. Like that's why Jesus came. It's it's to be born again. I think is a very literal thing. I think it means a new body, you know, and everything else. It's because this world is fallen, including your your body. There's nothing yeah. you can do about that. And that's it's it's about what's in the heart. It's about it's 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 a spirit thing. It's a, it's a whole. We've got so thing, many factors know? against us right now. Just so many. <laughs> yeah. I mean, between the air and what may or may not be sprayed. You know, all those ice crystals. Oh. Yeah, and that, yeah. <laughs> yeah and and then our food and you know we've got so many things against us i mean i know i'm dealing with lupus and shelly i'm on blood thinners 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. All kinds of issues that we've got. And of course you got the red hair and the green eyes and all the, you know, other things going on. And it was a very interesting study. We came to absolutely no conclusions. No. It was None. just an exploration. Yeah, we and don't have say that though. That's why that's why my series is called Question the Narrative, because <laughs> I'm asking questions. I, I, I don't I think I've ever come, come up, to a solid conclusion on anything. Yeah, I did yeah. come up with some like uh, dietary things that might help some, some, you know, supplements that, that might help various issues and some that our family is trying the methylated B12. We're, we're trying that, um, you know, it, a lot of people don't realize that we're usually mineral deficient in our lives today, we're not getting enough minerals from our foods. So I definitely usually, um, our family takes colloidal minerals on a regular basis and, you know, things like that. Uh, but yeah, we're falling apart. I I'm looking forward to the new heavens and the new earth. And that that's the big reason that I am not a full preterist is because I feel like we're sitting on a bunch of dead things and, I don't see that as a new earth. Uh, and I, I want a legit, I have no doubt that there's a spiritual new heaven and new earth aspect to that, but I'm looking for an actual new heaven and new earth Mm -hmm. where we can kind of go back and forth in between. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's funny because that is actually a common rebuttal I always get. It's kind of like, there's no way Jesus has come back. This is not the new heaven or new earth. It's completely corrupt and evil and terrible. And it's kind of, again, skipping over Revelations 27 again. What about that short season? <laughs> You're just going to miss yeah. that short season out. <laughs> like, yes, the, of course, this is not the new heaven and new earth. Of course it's not. Like, this is probably the, one of the hot, most horrible times to be alive. And there's been bad, worse prior to us as well, which we, can, we have histories for. This is, uh, by that I mean past 2000 years has been a horrible time to be alive not just us in the past 60 years which has been pretty bad as well you know but that argument i've heard quite a lot and yes there will be a new heaven and new earth at the end of all of this and that's, that's because not... a lot of preterists they they do think that we are living on the new earth right now so they already think that all of that is over with mm-hmm. and to preterists the the short season is really just a very, very short amount of time, like barely worth mentioning. Mm -hmm. It's just when Satan was released and, you know, the battle of Gog and Magog was fought and they surrounded the camp of the saints, but they don't look at it as an extended period of time. Mm -hmm. Um, I was watching, um, now this was an all-millennialist YouTube channel and he was reading through the book of Revelation and there was another part of Revelation where they use the term a little while, which is actually what the short season is more often called in the translations. It's I, I've rarely seen it actually say short season. It usually says that Satan was released for a little while. And so in that one, when it came to the earlier time that that phrase was used, it was actually referring to an event that only took about two years time. Hmm. So when they are, so they're just not really giving much thought to, to, you know, the, the short season actually being like, you know, 250 plus years that a lot of us are thinking that it could be. Hmm. And it's also just because of the way that they're reading revelation, um, because it says in, I think it's revelation one, one, that these things must happen quickly. Hmm. And, um, so they're looking at it as all of revelation must happen quickly including revelation 20 21 22 that it all must have happened right after jesus was crucified just a very short period of time mm-hmm. and so to me that was very compelling i was like wow it really does says these things must happen quickly and it has all of revelation but then if you actually factor in that it does say a thousand years in Revelation 20. So to me, that would kind of mean that it already says these things must happen quickly. But then there's going to come a point where there's going to be the, the millennial kingdom, which is a thousand years. Mm-hmm. Now, the preterists usually don't take that literally. But if you take that literally, then that that does that means that not all of Revelation has to be um, completed quickly. Mm-hmm. I hope that I'm making sense. No, that does make. But that's sense. why yeah. a lot of them are are saying that we're all that we're already on the new heavens and new earth because a lot of preterists believe that that has all already been finished. The white throne judgment, everything is already ended. 
-hmm. Which, if you are a full preterist and you've made it this long, Shelly and I would like to have somebody, if you're familiar with the Mud Flood, the Tatarian stuff, the biblical cosmology, and you would like to, you know, get on an interview with us, we would love to have you on and have a discussion about this stuff. Yeah, because we and we, we would be coming at it from a very, you know, friendly way because I find the whole thing extremely interesting. We will be on preterism right now. So, yeah, I was there to defend it when everyone else was bashing it. So just keep that in mind that this would be. <laughs> Shelly and I have idea. actually gone round and round. This this is proof <laughs> that that, you know, you can disagree on things and, you know, toss things back and forth. And I love a good debate. I absolutely love a good debate and, and you know yeah i do, i'm all for let, let's get on here and let's discuss this stuff yeah hmm. i think there is a, a popular youtuber going around right now who is a name millennial so maybe that's who you were talking about um i can't remember his name i'm blanking bruce right gore now. is it bruce gore because that's who be. i was talking about it might be um is he quite a young a young lad I think oh no this face. is an older he's an older man and i think his videos are from like several years ago so right okay fair, fair enough yeah, yeah i think there are people out there who have always been like this is what i'm saying just because we're suddenly talking about this this odd little season concept there are people who are these amillennialists who have always had this worldview that we're living already in it or like you said it's it's hard to tell what they believe or what where they think we are in a timeline to be honest every time i try and listen to them because it is this nebulous time frame of the church age they talk about and this this you know, i think you know. where somebody believes that they were in the new heavens and new earth and everything's already happened if they're not familiar with what's been brought out about the tatarian empire mm. and the mud floods and the the uh the petrified trees well the preterists yeah. though they they kind of look at it more as a spiritual new earth right so to, to and them it really i don't think that the mud flood and everything would make much of a difference because when they are seeing the new earth they just mean that we have the new covenant now we are mm. away yeah so that's how they see it so i don't know that the mud flood i could be wrong <laughs> but i don't know that the mud flood and tartaria and everything would have much of an effect on them because they they just really see the the new earth as being we are in the new covenant now and that's what the new earth is yeah i i just wouldn't want to personally interview somebody who who wasn't really aware familiar. of it yeah yeah because i feel like that's my big hang up mine is that they think that satan is already in the lake of fire i'm like i don't know how can you yeah. think that how can um, you think that yeah especially because i've had some well and i've so have you donita i don't know about you paul but we've had some what we'll what we'll call supernatural experiences and so if you have these demonic influences and entities that are still out here now then how could satan be thrown in the lake of fire so that's a question that i would like to ask a full preterist is how yeah, well, is that I, it's not all in our head you know i i agree i mean i i like i said i am very well aware that dmt jesters still exist you know which are the nephilim disembodied the nephilim is still here in disembodied yeah. form as he explains in enoch you know they become wandering spirits that thirst and hunger and cause offenses they become the demons when they become disembodied they are definitely still here from yeah. personal like from personal experience and they will be destroyed when the heaven and earth is put into the lake of fire and yes a new heaven and earth that's when they finally get done for you know along yeah. with everything that created them uh, but until then we're still dealing with them until that time yeah and, and if they're they, still you know, here then that means that it hasn't all been completed in my book because no they're still there and you you can't you can't just write it off as being in someone's head when you have multiple people having the same thing happening to them who don't even know each other Mm -hmm. you know and that's how that's what happened in my situation so that's it's like, legal like a lot of it i'm like bigfoot this in oklahoma what it's legal to hunt bigfoot in yeah. oklahoma that's so cool so, what what how how do you explain that how do you explain that yeah <laughs> yeah and i'm like you know and so for me i found the whole full preterism thing very very interesting because there are a lot of very compelling verses and passages that they use and so for donita it was the new heavens and the new earth that are really 
kind of like, nope, that's what's keeping her mainly away, not the only thing. And for me, it's Satan being thrown in the lake of fire. I'm like, nope, I, I can't, I haven't found an explanation that satisfies me about how that could possibly be the case. So yeah. Yeah. yeah, we'll see. We'll see if anyone could have an answer for that. That I'm like, oh, well, maybe. But so far, no, that's the one thing I'm like, no, I I can't I can't go full preterist for that reason. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, it, it does feel like, like I said in this day and age now with, with the information sharing capacity we have at our fingertips, we're seeing more evidences previous people who had similar worldviews didn't have to justify why they thought the millennial kingdom would come. So you, you get these people with their best guess coming up with concepts like preterism or our millennialism because they don't they don't know about let's say the tartarian histories or these evidences for a global culture and architecture the these things we can start to see now because we have google earth where we literally can go anywhere and look at any building in 3d immediately yeah. and we can we can make patterns now and recognize things they just did not have the capacity to do at a previous time where the technology was lacking so this is why I say our foundations for getting to these conclusions, I think, are a lot stronger and more weighty than it was in the past, where it was all up for debate. And I feel yeah. like, again, a lot of these people who still have these traditional views of, let's say, full preterisms, their justifications now are going to start to look a lot weaker compared to the type of information we're bringing to the table. But just And it's not their fault. It's, it's not malevolence on their behalf. It's, it's No. It's ignorance, you know. I like to, I like to assume stupidity before evil, you know, most of the time, or a lack of knowledge before intentional. To just, to it's deceive, easy you know. to do that whenever you can admit your own ignorance and stupidity through the years, you know, leading yeah. up to. I, and the more I learn, the less I realize I know. Mm -hmm. You know, so. That's, I, I said that too. I said, it's like the more things that I learn, the more confused I get because it's yeah. like, as soon as you think you have something figured out, you learn something new that flies in the face of what you thought you had figured out. And you're like, oh my gosh, I'm back to square one. Yeah. You get one rabbit hole taken care of and there's five more going <laughs> in different directions. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I, yeah. I think I think these people who you know you, you want to get on, for example, they probably know the word really well. They're probably very well educated in the Bible, which is great. We actually need people like that to then see what we've got and say, "What do you think of this?" So then they mm -hmm. can apply that wealth of knowledge they've got about the Bible and the Word and Scripture to what they're seeing, and they can probably give us insights we just probably won't be able to get from our ignorant you know, views. Right. I, yeah. I'm not a, I'm not a biblical scholar or expert. I've admitted yeah. that plenty of times. I'm doing the best I can with what I've got. Right. OK, and I don't I, I'm not an authority. I'm not a, I don't have a church or a ministry. I've never claimed anything like that, you know, and yeah. I'm, I'm not a biblical scholar. But I, I do want people who are to sincerely look at this information and not just outright go, no, you're wrong. That's just heretical nonsense. And, yeah. I'm, I'm, and you <laughs> know, that is one thing that I do appreciate my pastor. He I as I'm doing my readings, um, I will text him all the time with questions. And he jokingly, he, he's like, your questions are always so hard. Why can't you ask me for something from Romans or something <laughs> like that? And he's very good natured about it. And he will even give me different points of view. He doesn't tell me this is how it is. He'll say, well, this is some people think this, but you're right. I can see how you're looking at it that way, because there are a lot of scholars who also see it your way. So he he is very good with with that. So I'm constantly bugging him with questions that I have. <laughs> so and we, yeah, I would like to have someone who's open and knowledgeable yeah 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 well we have i really was not planning on going the whole two hours but this has been a wonderful discussion and i thank you both for being on here do you have any closing thoughts before we close up just that um remember that you can look at things differently from other believers and it doesn't mean that they are being led by Satan. Um, you just need to remember that the gospel needs to be our core message. It needs to be the foundation of what we believe in. And many of the things that we're searching out now and bickering over, we will not find out this side of heaven. And we need to be okay with that. Mm -hmm. No, I, I absolutely agree. Um, we, there's a, a huge problem I find with know-it-allism, especially in Christianity conspiracy circles. 
Um, there's there's a lot of people out there who want to tell you they know 100% what the truth is and they will shout at you this message and say, if you don't follow what I believe, you're going to hell. And I would just say, if anyone's telling you that, you probably shouldn't be listening to them because we do not know it all. And there are some things we need to be okay with understanding that we will not know until the very end. And same right. message as you, Shelley. It's a great message and I stand by it. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you both. And remember, you can make it through the dust storms of life with God's divine help. Da, 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 da.